As we, we did begin Matthew chapter 4 last, last week, if you remember, if you weren't here, we, we did get through three verses. We finished chapter 3 last week, uh, and uh, if I remember correctly, we, we got through verse 2, and, if, and we were talking about now, by way of uh, just reminding us of where we're at here, Jesus at this point, uh, you know, He goes out into the wilderness where John the Baptist is baptizing and preaching. And remember, John the Baptist's message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we talked a lot about what repentance means, what the kingdom of heaven is truly, how it's defined. And, and now Jesus comes in, in the end of chapter 3 there, and he says to John the Baptist, permit it for now that you baptize me. And you know, John the Baptist is like, what are you kidding me? I need to be baptized by you. And John the Baptist knew something. There was something that he learned while he was alone, living in the wilderness, living in the desert there, uh, God teaching him, obviously, he learned something about this one that was to come. He knew what his ministry was going to be. It was that of a herald. You know what a herald is? We don't need those today. We got the internet and we got all kinds of ways of communicating. But used to be before they had any forms of communication that were electronic, somebody would go throughout the town and they would shout the news. Somebody's coming, you know, this is going on, that's going on. And, and so, there, you know, he had that, that particular job. It was his role to be a herald, to alert the people that the promised Messiah, the, the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Covenant, God had promised he was going to bring forth a, a new uh, a Savior, a new work, a new thing. And, and that was his role. He said, I'm gonna, this is my role. I'm, I'm going to baptize people because they need to be forgiven of their sins. They need to turn from their sins in preparation to receive this promise that God has been saying throughout the Old Testament. And so that's his role. Jesus comes to meet him out there where he's baptizing people. You remember Pharisees and Sadducees, curious about the interest of what was, why were all these people coming out to see John the Baptist? What is it that he's doing that is so interesting? Why are all these people, and, and of course, they're, I'm sure they're feeling threatened because, you know, if you're, if you're a religious leader, who, you know, you're really not ministering to people grace and truth, but instead you're, you're looking to build a constituency and you want, the more popular you are, the more successful you are, you have followers who, who are following after you. That's what you're really after. So they're threatened because, wait a minute, who is this new guy on the scene? Who is he? Should we, is he going to steal people away from us? Because that's our living right there. And so they come out to see what's going on, and John the Baptist calls it like he sees it. He says, you brood of vipers who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come, because they're so steeped in ritualism and legalism. And they were leading the people in such a way that they were beating the sheep, and they were not leading them to forgiveness of sins. And so John the Baptist had to step in and say, you're sinners, and you need to be forgiven of your sins. You need to repent. That message was missing. Or if it wasn't missing, why would John the Baptist need to say it? It was missing among the people of the Jews. And you know what? It's missing today. More and more every day today in our culture, that part of the gospel message gets left out. Repent. If you don't see yourself as a sinner, how are you possibly going to see the need for a Savior? The two go hand in hand, and, and we've talked a lot about this again the past three weeks now. If you're going to be forgiven for something, if you're going to be saved from something, you first have to see yourself as in need of forgiveness. It's the most important element. And if we get so far today, we'll see that Jesus' first public message in verse 17 of chapter 4 is the exact same message that John the Baptist began with. Simple. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and another key a bit of understanding here that we have to identify with. We have to get our, our minds around this if we're to understand chapter 3 and 4 of Matthew is that the things that Jesus is doing here are primarily so that he can fully identify with us in our human condition. You ever realize that? In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll point you to some verses here. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it for you. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 say this, Therefore, in all things he, this is, the author of Hebrews, my opinion, the Apostle Paul, writing about Jesus, in all things he had to be made like his brethren. That is, that he had to take up the identity of the very creation that he's coming to minister to. 
And this is why. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You see what's going on here? God taking on the form of his own creation for the purpose of redeeming us, and in doing so, knowing that he needed to suffer all things that we suffer so that when it comes to his role as priest in our lives, he can fully identify with us in every way, with one exception. He did not sin. That's the one exception, and that's why, it makes it, that's why it's so hard for us to see what's going on in these you know, chapter 3 and chapter 4. Why is Jesus being baptized? He has no need for repentance. Why is Jesus being led out into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted? He has no sin. I don't understand. But you see in these verses, and in fact in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it says this, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But in, listen, in all points he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. The consequence, the writer of Hebrews sums up this way, therefore, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. You see, Jesus, in the role of a high priest, we all know what the role of a priest is, right? The role of a priest is to represent God to the people. We all get that part. But the role of a priest is also to represent the people to God. You go before God on behalf of the people. You go before the people on behalf of God. You intercede. You stand in the gap. That's what Jesus knew that he was going to do. And in doing so, going to the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us continuously, in order to fully identify with us, this chapter 3, this chapter 4 needs to happen, and he knows that. And so we get to chapter 4, you know, Jesus is baptized at the end of chapter 3, he comes up out of the water, immediately it says, the, the voice of the Father is speaking from heaven. And, and something was descending from heaven, and the best language that the writer could come up with is it looks something like a dove descending, and it was, he knew it was the Holy Spirit coming. The Holy Spirit came and, and came upon Jesus, you know, anointing him for, you know, what was about to happen and then leading him. How, how important is that, by the way? You come to a faith-based relationship with God, although Jesus didn't need to come to that because he already was God, but we come to that and immediately the Spirit wants to lead. We come to repentance, recognizing that we're sinners. The very next thing that happens is the Spirit comes and wants to lead. In fact, the Spirit's already there. How, do you know you, how, did, how did you think you knew you needed re to repent in the first place? The Spirit came and showed you that. And now, the, now you've been, all right, I need to repent. And this thing that Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago, I needed that. And, and, and now I've rep I'm turning from my sins. I'm receiving the forgiveness of sins on the cross, what Jesus did for me. But guess what? Now the Spirit wants to lead. And this is an area where I see the most struggle in the church today, is people being led. Well, how do you know where God's leading? Very interesting question. The first place he leads Jesus is out into the desert. I don't want to go to the desert, you say. I don't blame you. I used to live in Arizona. Arizona. Hey, listen, it's a beautiful place. You can see really far there because um, there's nothing really to block your view. It's, there's some nice things about it. Tombstones there. It's really fun to go check out the OK Corral. My dad carries guns now. Scary thought. But the desert is where Jesus was led to face temptation. And that's where we're, that's where we're, we're seeing the flesh of Jesus needed to suffer so much of what we suffer, in fact, in all points. I don't think every one of us suffer in all points. I think some of us suffer and struggle with some things, and maybe others of us, you know, we never do really ever come to uh, experience those sufferings and struggles, but we have our own set of, but Jesus in everything suffered and struggled temptation. And so, you know, we, we come here, we're in 
Verse 2 says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That is, that that sense of hunger had returned to him. Because after you start fasting, you have a sense of hunger. You know, two, second day, third day, you're real hungry. That hunger seems to go away. But they, they'll tell you right about the time when, when the body is saying, I need food or else I'm going to die, that sense of hunger returns again, and that's usually about 40 days. Jesus led his flesh, led by the Spirit. He cooperated with the Spirit, was led and, and allowed his flesh to be led to a place of near death. That's the reality for you and I. If the Spirit's leading you, where's the Spirit leading you? Death of your flesh. That's where the Spirit wants to lead you. What points do you struggle in? The desert's where you're going to figure that out. You find yourself in the desert. I know, again, you know, we often, we struggle with this, you know, these desert experiences. We talk about them as, you know, woe is me, you know. But, but talk, think about it in this sense. Praise the Lord, God, is, He loves me so much, He wants to put my flesh to death. He wants to, you want to be changed? You want to become more like Christ? Your flesh needs to die. Amen? I, I wanted to throw this verse out to you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, says simply this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it rob robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no repu reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. What's required in having this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, is humbling yourself to the point of death of your flesh, that you might be led through the desert, that you might discover who you really are. And you know, sometimes that's a fearful thing. Like, all right. Lord, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I see myself more clearly. I see what a filthy, rotten, stinking sinner I really am. Sometimes that's hard to take. You know, we like to feel better about ourselves. And the Bible always seems to lead us to feel worse about ourselves, right? But there's a good about yourself that you can feel that's true, and then there's a, a bad about yourself that you should embrace. And Jesus wants to lead us to that. Verse 3, after fasting... <coughs> excuse me, 40 days, 40 nights, the sense of hunger returning, the flesh at its weakest possible point now. Jesus in the flesh. He cannot rely on his flesh. And the tempter comes. Satan, that is. Excuse me. Now, when the tempter had come to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. That sense of hunger... The first thing Satan will do, and the first thing he does to Jesus, is attempt, before we get into the sense of hunger, to cast doubt on truth. Attempt to cast doubt on truth. And so he says to Jesus, now, let me, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, because the Greek, there's something funny going on here, but it says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones, okay? Well, in Greek grammar, this word if could also accurately, just as accurately, be translated since or because. So reread it again, and, and he could literally be saying here, since you're the Son of God, or because you're the Son of God, or if. Any one of those three words is accurate. Now, different guys will debate over which one's the right one. You know what? It really doesn't matter. Is, the question is, though, is Satan casting doubt on Jesus' identity to Jesus? Well, probably not. But I think in one sense he is. He's like, you know, he's tempting, he's trying to tempt Jesus to prove it. He's saying to Jesus, well, if or since you're the Son of God, prove it. Or, let me put it to you this way. He's saying, you're hungry, and since you're the Son of God, solve your own problem in the flesh. You should be able to command these stones that they should become bread. He's tempting him to solve his own problems in the flesh. That's what he's doing here. And that's exactly how he works with us. He tries to get us to help God solve our own problems. That's a good place to start. Instead, Jesus knows that what he has to do is, is keep his hands off of it and let God solve his problems. When you're doubting the truth that Satan is, is casting a shadow of doubt upon, I always give this little bit of advice. 
and I heard this in a message a long time ago from another pastor, I can't remember his name. He said simply this. Oh, it was Jack Hibbs. He said, return to the place where you last saw God work. Return to the place where you last saw God work. In your mind or whatever, or in your notes, in your journals, or whatever it may be, the last time you encountered God speaking to you and, and you having leaving a set of circumstances saying, you know what, that was the Lord, you know? Return to that place in your mind, in your journals, where, however you do it. Talk about it with someone who experienced it with you. But go back there. What God has told you in your past, what He has done in your life, if you're doubting today, if the enemy is casting doubt on the promises of God, return to that place because that was a principle we see repeated throughout the Old Testament. In fact, the Jews were told to take stones out of the bottom of the Jordan near Jericho and stack them so that future generations could go there and see those stones. And remember, once a year, the Jews, they do this to this day, by the way, they make tents outside their houses and they live in them in order that they would remember the days of wandering in the desert and the faithfulness of God. That's, an, in a sense, a way of returning to a, a major place where they saw God work. You drive through Lakewood and you see these houses along Catiline Road or through the back neighborhoods, and you see these makeshift little huts outside, attached to the side of the house. And you're like, what is that? Well, they go and they live in that. They, they will not live inside their house for a time so that they can teach their kids. This is what it was like for our descendants who dwelt in the desert. Interestingly, they dwelt in the desert for 40 years. 40 seems to be a number of consecration. You ever hear that? You ever hear any preachers teach that before? Whenever the Lord is trying to get more world out of you and more Jesus in, there's a, there's a need for consecration. And it seems that there's this interesting number that pops up in the Scriptures of 40. 40 days of fasting, 40 days or 40 years in the wilderness. Moses was 40 days in the presence of God without food or water, and so on and so forth. You see this number repeating. Now, back to, to verse 3 here. He, he does cast doubt, in a sense, on the identity of Christ. Not so important which side of that debate you fall on. I don't think it's all that important. But he goes right after his flesh. Take charge, he's basically saying. That's the temptation. Take charge. Uh, evil will seek the weakness in your flesh as a target. That's what he's doing. If you struggle with lust, Satan and his demons are not likely to attack you with the t temptation of uh, gluttony, right? Why? They will look for your weakness and try to use it against your walk with the Lord. That's what Satan's trying to do. That's what the enemy, the demons are trying to do. Trying to get you, your focus, your attention off of Jesus. The temptation Jesus is facing is to solve the problem of the hunger of his flesh with the wisdom of, or the power of his flesh rather than wait for the Lord to solve the problem according to his will. Because who led him out to the wilderness? The Spirit. If he now turns and solves his own problem, would he then be circumventing what God's trying to do? That's the point. The Father, the Spirit, knew how close to death and hungry Jesus was was. And, and Jesus could have commanded the stones to become bread, but I think he would have been missing something important in his human experience. His desire, his need to fully identify with our flesh, he would have been cutting that short and therefore not fully experiencing what he was intended to experience. And so many times I think we get in the way of things that God is trying to do in our own lives or in other people's lives. We throw money at things. We throw resources and people at things. And let me tell you something. I'm a firm believer in putting resources and money in places where God is leading. But when God's trying to do something and we just try to step in there in human wisdom and solve the problems, or, or like Bill and I have talked about this a lot, when we, we had it in our hearts that eventually, man, we really want to get a youth group together. And by the way, we got one and it's going great. And, and, but yet we, we struggle with, should we do it now? Is it too soon? Or When's God doing it was the question we always came back to. Is God doing this? And we, didn't we, Bill? We struggled over that for a while. And, and we sat back and we waited, and all of a sudden it seemed like the Lord brought it all together. And it just happened so simply and easily. We, although sometimes I'm sure it feels hard for you. But it wasn't like we forced it. We didn't force our will on God. Jesus responds to Satan's temptations. This is what he says, verse 4. Look with me, if you will. 
He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How important is it for you to know what you believe, where it comes from, and why you believe it? Look at Jesus' answer again. Bread, not important. Not important. Why? Because I trust that God the Father and the Spirit know exactly how hungry I am. They know exactly how close I am to coming to the point of death and that at the very right time, they're going to come and they're going to make sure I don't die. Interesting. And then he says, this is what's important. That I live not according to feeding my flesh and making sure that I have the things I need, but instead that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God be my food. How important is it that we know why we believe, what we believe, and where it comes from? The relationship with God, the Word of God. What do you base your theology on? The word theology is just a simple word. Theo, God, uh, ology is the study or the knowledge of. You know, what we believe about God. Theology. What do you base it on? I find that Christians today predominantly base their theology on their experience. You ever notice that? They define God according to their experiences, the things that they experience in the world. There's a word for that, by the way. It's called existentialism. And then when they hear somebody like me get up and, they, and teach or preach a sermon, they take what they hear and they interpret it to fit their experiences. That's not the way God intended it. Reject the things of the flesh and embrace the things of the Word of God. There's two different kinds of food in view here that Jesus is saying. And interestingly, Jesus, we later, we learn, is spoken of as the Word Himself. He's the Word become flesh. He is obviously not confused here. Because in spite of the fact that His circumstances would lead Him to come to a different conclusion, He says no. He the weakest possible point of His flesh, and He knows he allows doctrine to be his foundation, the Word of God to be his foundation. Therefore, he's not shaken. By the way, on the subject of being shaken, you could read Psalm 62 for homework. Pretty interesting. Now, what is Jesus? Let's analyze his answer a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's, he's basically quoting here. He's saying, you know, what's important to me is the Word of God, what God says. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verses 1 through 3, every commandment, this is what it says, which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply. Look at the benefits and blessings, simply, of obeying the commands in the Word of God. That you may live and multiply. Certainly this morning we see the Kiernans are, fulfill, are being fulfilled in their blessing of observing the Word of God. And that you may go in and possess the land which the Lord has swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Interesting correlation there, isn't it? Jesus was led 40 days in the wilderness. This quote, this section of Scripture, he's talking about the people of Israel were led 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Look at this. To humble you and to test you to know what is in your heart. The temptation isn't for God to see what's in you. When you, you know, how many people think this? When you're in the desert, that you ever have this idea, well, God's trying to see what's really in my heart. No. God already knows everything that's in your heart and your mind. He's trying to show you what you don't know about yourself. That's the reality. And every one of us, myself included, needs that. We need to see ourselves more from God's perspective, more from the Word of God's perspective, as Jesus is doing here, than from our own perspective. The desert is so that we would see ourselves and know ourselves to be what we really are. It goes on to say, verse 3 in Deuteronomy, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know. By the way, that's what the word manna means is, what is this? <laughs> Men, that's not something you want to say at dinner time when you sit down at the table. But trust me, I'm just warning you, you don't want to say, what is this? Anyway, that's what manna meant.
But he humbled you, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know. You've never seen it before, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives according to or by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Two different food sources. One's spiritual, one's physical. Let the flesh die and feed the spirit. God will make sure your flesh lives as much as it needs to live or dies as much as it needs to die. One other interesting thing about manna, as Jesus uh, quotes from Deuteronomy and makes reference to it indirectly, <clears throat> it was the perfect, we learned from, you know, this is what we learned from Scripture about manna. It was the perfect superfood nutritionally. Those of you who are nutritionalists, you know, from a perspective of eating healthy and, you know, this is the way we really should be living and not add all this, that's absolutely true, I believe in it. Manna was like the perfect superfood. Did you know that? It had every single thing your body needs to be healthy. If we could eat manna today, we'd probably be, I mean, not probably, we'd definitely be a lot healthier than we are right now. There's so much junk in our foods, it's un unbelievable. But you also learn from Scripture that it really didn't taste like much. Kind of like tofu, you know what I mean? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if manna was ex almost exactly like tofu. <laughs> you know how people that who, who actually eat tofu, they describe it this way. They go, well, it really kind of takes on the flavor of whatever you cook it with. <laughs> Anything that needs to take on the flavor of something else, I'm thinking, why? You know, what are you just trying to fill, fill yourself up? And I guess that's one good reason for it, and that makes sense. But, but uh, it's not appealing to the flesh, you guys. Manna was not something you looked at and go, man, I can't, I'm salivating. I can't wait to sink my teeth into that. That's not manna. And when God provides for your needs, He's more concerned with sustaining and developing your life and your likeness of Jesus than He is with appealing to your flesh. He doesn't care about appealing to your flesh. Do you get the point? Let's go to verse 5. Then the devil took him up to a holy city, to the holy city, the holy city, <clears throat> set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, quoting from Psalms here, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, Jesus picked up on something that, or excuse me, Satan picked up on something that Jesus did here and he realized what Jesus was doing. Use the word of God to, to defend yourself against temptation. Okay, I'm gonna try to appeal to you then spiritually. I tried to appeal to your flesh. Now I'm going to try to appeal to the spiritual side of you. He, he responds to Jesus trying to use the scriptures themselves to cause Jesus to sin. Yes, it's true. The scripture does prophesy that the angels would take care of or care for the Messiah and keep him from harm. Didn't we just see that in chapters 1 of 2 of Matthew? How supernaturally, through natural circumstances... Joseph and Mary, led by words of the angels, they had to go by faith, trusting that these things were true and they were from God, right? That they led Jesus to Egypt to protect him. They led him, you know, to Nazareth, all to fulfill the prophecies written in the scriptures. Notice, though, the difference between Satan's quote, what he quotes of scripture, and the actual rendering of the true word of God. And this, by the way, is another primary method. We see a lot of religious circles uh, in, around, in and around us. Lots of expressions of religion. Some of them even calling themselves Christian. Okay? And they're not. As if we examine their doctrine, we can become very familiar with the fact that they're clearly not. Mormonism, for example, is widely believed, and Jehovah Witnesses, by the way, are also widely believed to be sects of Christianity. But they take the word of God out of context. Look at this. This is the actual quote from Psalm 91, verses 11 through 13. For he shall give his angels charge over you. And now listen, this was not left. This was left out. To keep you in all your ways. So the, the question then becomes, okay, well, God is providing protection and direction through angels for the Messiah. But for what purpose? To keep in all his ways, to keep him in all his ways. Well, what are his ways? It's his purpose. It's what he was put here to do. And then it goes on to say, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. He left that part out <laughs> conveniently, right? <laughs> I don't want to talk about that, but I'll quote the other part. Well, we'll try and use scripture against you. It's just like Satan to slip lies in or to leave out important context from the Word of God in order that your theology would lead to doubt or sin. Did you get that? That's why, again, it's so important that we, you know, that, look, you guys, I'm, I'm so happy you come here. Because if you stop coming, I wouldn't, what point would I have, right? My life would have question marks all surrounding it. But if you guys just come here on Sundays and Wednesdays or Saturday mornings to the men's group or the ladies' Bible study, and you listen to what's taught, and you don't go check it out yourself, that's kind of sad, really. Look, life's hard. It's hard to find the time to spend time on your own between you and the Lord and the Scriptures. But use these things that you hear on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, all these times that we set aside for Bible studies and things. Use that, those Scriptures to go back and dig deeper on your own. You're like, where do I start? That's where you start. Where's God, you know, ministering to you? Is it Sunday morning messages? Is, is it Wednesday? Is it which one is it? What are you doing? What, where's God touching your heart? Well, go back and spend some time in those scriptures. You know, learn how to use a concordance. Dig deeper. It's true. God will protect us. He protected Jesus according to his will and sovereign purpose. And so we see the need to understand that God comes uh, from all things. Good comes from all things. Excuse me. I'm reading from my notes to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. God will protect us. He'll bring about His plans in us. And He'll use all these bad circumstances, earthly bad, for His good. That's true. But we need to let God do things His way in His time. Jesus, again, refuses to sin, and He answers with the foundation of truth, saying it's not for Him to give an... Listen to this. This is the exact quote in the Greek. All out test to the Lord. Notice he doesn't, he's, well, I'm, about, I'm going to read this in verse 7. He doesn't get into a debate with Satan over the meaning of Scripture. Who better, by the way, to debate with him? Right? Jesus could debate Scripture better than anyone. He is Scripture. He doesn't bother with that. Look what he does. Verse 7. It is written again. Again, because I just quoted Scripture to you. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And let me, let me rephrase that, the actual quote. And that's pretty good. But it, you shall not give an all-out test to the Lord your God. All out is the difference. Tempt Him. Now, this gets kind of confusing. Confuse, confusing because people confuse these two words, test and tempt. And we see in James, we see some quotes about God testing and and then, well, wait a minute, what about Malachi 3 where it says we can test God? Let me just talk about this for a second. Jesus says, when he says it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The Greek word used here and also found in James chapter 1, verse 12 is the same root, but they're translated tempt and test, two different ways. So it, they're the same root word, but there's different uh, post fixes on them in the Greek grammar. So what's the difference? Well, if we, if we look at the fact that Jesus says, right here he says, we're not to tempt God. And you turn to, to James 1 and you look and it says that God cannot be tempted, right? Same root word we're talking about here. Jesus says, you do not tempt, I'm, sh I'm not to tempt God. But he also says, in, in James the word says, uh, you know, at the same time it says God cannot even be tempted, right? But in Malachi 3 it says this, Where's my, where's my reference to that? can't find it. Well, anyway, let me give you a brief synopsis of what's going on in Malachi 3. Verse 10, I want you to look it up. It says, God speaks through the prophet and says to test him. If you read it there, I probably have it on the next page in my notes. He specifically says through Malachi to test him to see if he will not pour out blessings from the floodgates of heaven. If we look carefully at the context and use, and use of these different words in the Old and the New Testament, we'll discover what the difference between seemingly the same word with the same root, the difference between the two is, between test and tempt, is the intent behind the issuer. It's the intent behind the issuer. You see, temptation, okay, temptation comes 
from someone outside of you with the intent or the purpose of you failing. Do you get that? If I try to lead you into some kind of temptation, my intent or my purpose is that you fail. Conversely, a test, much like happens in this school very often by teachers, the intent of the teachers giving a test is that they pass, is it not? And so when God says in Malachi, he says, test me in this and see if it's not true. He's, his intent in offering that we test him is that he is proven faithful. When God issues a test to you, his desire is that you'd be proven faithful. Sometimes you need to be encouraged and you need to see, you need to go through a test and see that you are in fact faithful. This is either a printing error or a sick joke. <laughs> Blank piece of paper in the middle of my notes. God says, try me and test me. In fact, here's the quote. I did have it. Bring all the tithes into the storehouses that there may be food in my house. And try me, he says, now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Interesting. It's interesting he, God has to use money to appeal to us on that. It's the hardest area for us to trust God sometimes. Verse 8. What a verse 8. Third form, we see Jesus' experience here of temptation. Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Wow. Now we're really getting to what's behind everything that Satan's trying to do here. Get this. The Spirit comes down out of heaven sent by God the Father to lead Jesus. Jesus accepts the leadership of the Spirit and follows. Temptation number one, temptation number two, and temptation number three have the same intent, to change the leadership. Who's leading Jesus? Satan wants to be the one leading Jesus. So if Satan can begin to give instruction to Jesus that Jesus follows, suggest things, cause him to get confused and, oh, well, yeah, why not? And he starts with something so subtle. Well, it's your, you, you have the power. Go ahead. Change these stones into bread. But by accepting that as his suggestion, he begins to be led by Satan. Do you get the difference here? Who are you led by? The king of the world or the king of heaven? Who are you led by? Zeke's pointing somewhere. Oh, okay, he's pointing up. That's a good thing, Zeke. That's a good thing. I thought you were trying to give me an idea that I've got to hurry up here. <laughs> You're probably right. The ultimate goal of Satan is the very cause of his current condition. The very goal of Satan is the very cause of his current situation, condition, position. He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped. He's not worthy of worship, but he craves worship. He offers nothing but sorrow and suffering, but he tries to desperately convince us that he can offer us wealth, power, health, and happiness. It never turns out the way he presents it to us. Did you ever notice that? When Satan offers you something and you accept it and you buy into it and you go for it, it's never what it seemed. It's never what it promised, is it? It's like advertising on television. You know, it, I, I, some of you have heard this before, but since Zoe's been young and able to, you know, understand what's going on on TV, probably more so than me, but we'll sit there and we'll watch TV together sometimes, and, and I haven't done this in a while, but I, I, I like to say to her, when the commercials are on, I, used to, I like to say to her, what are they trying to sell us, Zoe? You know, and she'll look at the commercial and she'll figure out what the product or what the service or whatever it is they're trying to sell us. And, you know, she usually is able to figure it out. And I'm like, I'm trying, I'm asking her those questions because I want her to get it through her head that those commercials are manipulative and they're trying, and I always say this to her, they're trying to take our money away. Are we going to let them take our money away? Well, she seems favorable to that if it's like a Barbie doll or something like that. She has no problem giving my money away when it's something that would appeal to her flesh. But at least I'm trying to teach her that principle because that's, 
That's how I am, by the way. I'm very skeptical. When I see a commercial, when I see something, even if it's something I know I need or want or I got, I know, man, I need to get that. I'm just like, you know, I just don't trust these people. It takes me a while to get convinced. That we need. I'm skeptical. I really am. Kind of that's how you need to be as a Christian. Everything that the world is appealing to you, it's appealing to your flesh, it's appealing to your spirit, it's appealing to you, you got to be skeptical. Well, but if you're skeptical, it, that's saying that, hey, you know, I'm analyzing this to see if it's of God or not, right? How are you going to know? The Word of God. That's how you know. The Word of God. Verse 10. <coughs> Jesus says to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written. Third time he quotes Scripture. You shall worship the Lord your God and obey Him only you shall serve. And the devil left him. Away with you, Satan. Away with you, Satan. Away with you, Satan. Get used to that. You know, um, Martin Luther. Has anybody ever seen the movie Luther? Raise your hand. Seen the movie Luther? Those of you who have not seen it, go rent it. It's, it's in, if Blockbuster and all them still have it, go rent it. It's, historically, it's very accurate. But there's a couple scenes in there that depict some of the realities in his life when, when he was, uh, you know, teaching in the Catholic uh, seminary, living in a monastery there. He had this room. In fact, it was, it was also when he was under trial. I forget where that was. I don't think it was in Wittenberg. I forget where it was. But he was about to go into trial, and he was, he was focusing and praying and studying and, and, you know, focusing and praying and studying. And all of a sudden, you would see him. He... he looked like something was around him and you could, you know, the camera view had the whole room. You're like, no one's there. It, like, it looked like he was possessed or something. Like, what's going on with this guy? And then all of a sudden he would just start talking to, to nothing. He would say things like, oh, it's you again. Haven't you given up yet? Don't you know that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm God's, you know, I can't follow. I can't. He, he was talking to, well, knowing who he is and the significance of his life, I wouldn't be surprised if it was Satan himself, not only his demons. You know? But it was like that for him in reality. He would just say, Psh, oh, it's you again. And it, isn't that funny how, you know, we, we can do that. We, we, we can get tempted and just say, Psh, not this time, buddy. I, try, I went tried that way. It brought me nothing but sorrow. Look at this. Well, first of all, James 4. Write this down. Look at it later. James 4, 7 through 10. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Just like Jesus said, away with you, Satan. He'll flee from you. Resist him and submit to God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's very comforting. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And keep yourself there until he lifts you up. That's what James was saying. The brother of Jesus. Humble yourself. Well, but what about this? Doesn't the Lord want me to be happy? Huh, I'm kind of confused here. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. What's this? Lament and mourn and weep? Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom? That doesn't sound like fun. No, but when you need to be purified, when you need to come face to face with something that's in your life, you need the more world taken out and more Jesus put in, you got to see yourself from God's perspective. And, and when being confronted with the reality of your own sinful nature, you weep, you lament, and you mourn. When we get to Matthew chapter 5, by the way, at this rate it could be in a year or so, we're going to see... In, in, in that awesome sermon that's preached so many different ways and times, we're going to see the reality of an experience with God. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed, blessed, blessed are those whose hearts are broken over sin. Blessed. Blessed. The reality of Jesus resisting Satan's temptations, resisting the temptation to change the leadership of, of his flesh from the spirit to the world is basically what's going on here. Satan, the king of this earth, right? I'm not going that way. I'm sticking with the word of God. I'm sticking with what I know to be true. Here's the result. Look at the 
verse 11. The devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The word minister simply means to serve. Served him. Ministered to him. I kind of get the picture here as I'm thinking about this scene. He had, his body had gotten so weak he probably couldn't even feed himself. The angels came, lifted his head, and put something into his mouth so that he could be nourished. Probably, hopefully, something like man, I would imagine. Something that didn't appeal to the flesh but nourished it back to life. Now the end of this section of Scripture brings us to the reality that God is faithful and that if we can wait for His timing, He will meet us right where we are with exactly what we need. It'll rarely be what we want. Rarely. But it'll be what we need. We can be led by our flesh or the whispers of evil demonic influences, or the Spirit. So the question for us is simple, which will it be? John wrote this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And I find an interesting correlation between Jesus' temptations in this verse, this section of Scripture. It says, Do not love the world or the things of the world, or in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of this world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You notice that? And, I, and, and I've heard preachers give sermons on, on how each one of these things, these three things mentioned here, sort of correlate to the three things that Jesus was tempted in. And, and, you know, I, I find there's some interesting similarities there. But, you know, ultimately, it comes down to one choice. Who's going to influence you the most? Is it going to be the world and your flesh? Or is it going to be the God the Father, the eternal kingdom, and the Holy Spirit? Let's all stand.